happy that you do that. <laughs> and of course, I'm happy. <laughs> But I, I, I strongly advise that everybody, uh, maybe um, Christina and Sabine, you also turn on your microphone and maybe even your camera so we can see you, because that would be nice to see we everybody. We around one table here. Yeah. Okay, good. So what I wanted to do is, is talk about exactly where we're at with paywalls in the middle of 2012, because it is just an absolutely fascinating phenomenon. Uh, just yesterday, I got a couple of press calls in the U.S. The Orange County Register in Southern California is a fairly large paper, and it was sold uh, yesterday to some private investors. And one of the questions that comes up when I talk to the press about that sale and other recent sales, Warren Buffett, you know, billionaire just bought a chain of newspapers, is why are why are people buying newspapers? And one of the reasons is uh, paywalls. So Warren Buffett specifically, and he is a man who knows money, has said it makes no sense to give away your product over here and charge for it over there. And that is, uh, that is the advice now that publishers on both sides of the Atlantic are taking and are putting up paywalls very rapidly. And I want to talk about that phenomenon and how it's working. So uh, this, of course, isn't new. We sell content. Um, newspapers have sold content for four centuries now. So this is not a new phenomenon. Um, and in fact, not selling the content but giving it away looks like it will be about a 20-year phenomenon. Subscriptions everywhere. Everybody understands subscriptions. They understand paying for single copies of papers. Uh, in fact, free dailies in most of the Western world are not doing that well right now, uh, but quality dailies are still being paid for. So let's look at the status here. Uh, by uh, the middle of next year, there will be more than 300 daily newspapers in the U.S. and Europe and Asia. It's also happening in Asia. It's happening in Japan and Singapore. Um, that will have paywalls in place. And I'm using paywall to have two quick words, uh, but then I'm going to be going back to digital circulation here. But this is a major phenomenon uh, basically across the developed world. Large, large papers, the largest uh, in the world, like the New York Times, uh, HS in Finland, um, and very small papers are doing it as well. Press Plus is the major enabler, really. They're making this possible for lots and lots of publishers because the authentication, the e-commerce, um, is something that is beyond, unfortunately, so many publishers. They haven't built out basic systems that allow people to pay. And if they don't have the systems that allow people to pay online, they can't charge them. Seems pretty basic, but that's been the case. So they now have uh, contracts or installations with more than 320 customers. Most of those are new daily newspaper companies, some magazines, and some online startups. And then we have Piano Media, not far from, from you all down in Bratislava. Uh, Slovenia and Slovakia announced. Uh, working on several other um, country-wide projects uh, in Europe, also working on some topical ways of getting money. Very similar to Press Plus in the idea of how to put this together. The services these companies offer, again, are ones that newspapers can't do themselves, most of them. Registration, authentication, e-commerce, customer management. If you look at the New York Times, which is now held up as one of the best examples in the field, one of the things that's most interesting about the New York Times is it took one year, a whole year, to put together the system. And the main reason was it wanted to be able to have a single view of its customers. It has print customers over here. It's going to have a lot more digital customers it knew. And it knew it needed to understand if this was the same person reading print and, and, and online, and ideally put together the profile information, both to serve better content online and to target for advertising. 
a lot of people miss how important this is. And, it's, and it is also important to realize that while Press Plus and uh, Piano help with the first things on this list, they don't do a lot of audience management. Audience management, audience tracking is something that has to be a core capability of newspaper or any kind of publishing company. So this is, is a major question going forward, and it's one of the reasons that the biggest companies like uh, FT, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, are so far ahead in doing this. The latest published numbers, about 450,000 uh, digital subscriptions for the New York Times, and I figure they have not released a number, that that is plus or minus $100 million a year in new circulation revenue. So that's a significant amount of money. Um, you all remember when the New York Times did Times Select, probably six years ago now. That was their first attempt to get people to pay. And from Times Select, after two years, they were only adding another $10 million a year. So this is, this is a success. Um, and we'll see how far it can go, but it is a success for the Times. In Helsinki, uh, Helsingin uh, Sanomat is the largest daily in Scandinavia, in the Nordic countries. And uh, kind of under the radar, what they did in 2009, which was an interesting time because it was the depth of the recession, they started charging for content. And because they started early and they figured out their system of how to do it and what was working and what wasn't, they're now up to getting an extra charge from about a third of their daily print subscribers. So about 130,000 subscribers are paying them extra, somewhere between three and seven euro a month. And now as new people sign up, they get most of those to get digital access as well. So a little different model, uh, but, but interesting, the timeline that they, they set out on, they didn't do that well, 2009, 2010. They figured out marketing, they figured out messaging, and they're now doing pretty well. We have smaller papers. This is a small paper right in the middle of the U.S., the Columbia Daily Tribune in Missouri. Um, it is a paper of, I think, about 25,000 circulation. Um, it put in a uh, digital circulation system about three years ago now and they're yielding about another hundred thousand dollars a year which there is enough for two plus positions in the newsroom so it's a matter of scale new york times hundred million dollars these guys a lot less but they're making it work the model here is very interesting for all of us uh, in and near the news business to think about and this is about the media blur so it used to be, we go back 30 or 40 years, news media were completely separate from how we thought about movies or music or um, television, whether it was early satellite television or you know, broadcast television. And now the model here, whether it's New York Times uh, or HS or all the papers that are doing it in, in Europe and the US is all access very simple consumer proposition that says okay pay us one time you're used to paying for content you're going to pay us one time but we're going to give you a lot more we're going to give you the ability to get it on your smartphone your tablet your computer and take some print and you'll be happy and just pay this one price hbo is now doing this with its programming uh, Comcast, which is the largest cable system in the U.S., is doing it. Uh, Berliner Morgan Post has been doing it. Axel Springer's been doing it for about three years. The FT is really the grandfather of a lot of this, having uh, done it uh, and built on it since, I think, 2001. Same model, and it's very simple for consumers, and I think that's hugely important. Content, we used to say, wants to be free. Now I'm saying content wants a fee. So six basic truths about where we're at. The Hippocratic Oath, a major part of Western civilization for medicine, do no harm. On the online side, the Hippocratic Oath is pretty simple. It is do no harm to digital ad sales. If we go back three years ago, 
when uh, Rupert Murdoch was huffing and puffing in San Diego at the uh, Newspaper Association of America meeting. This was January 2009. He was railing against Google, and he was saying, we have to charge, we have to charge. Most people in the newspaper industry on both sides of the Atlantic would say, we're scared. If we charge, we'll cut our audience so much that we'll lose our digital ad growth. And that's really the only growth we have is digital ad growth because plainly the print business is turning down. Long story short, in three years, the major learning has been that if you do this right, and there are ways to do uh, paid content and digital circulation wrong, but if you do it right, you don't need to lose advertising sales uh, in the digital area. So that takes away the major fear. Then on the positive side, what we have is that digital circulation can boost circulation revenue by at, at least as much as 10%. May go up from there, but we have good examples of that now where we're pushing 10%. So circulation revenue in a, for a lot of newspaper companies was essentially flat up a couple points, down a couple of points before newspapers started charging for digital access. They had lost reader, paying readers, but they had increased pricing, so overall circulation revenue was flat. Now they can get a 10% increase. But to do that, it's all about execution. There's a whole bunch of things they need to do right to make it work. Otherwise, they can put in systems that might not do much harm, but they're not going to do much good. And I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but these are among the, the, the considerations that all publishers have to take as they go through an execution strategy, and you can all see them on here. Um, I, could add, I could add a couple of extra ones. Many publishers have looked at this simplistically, at least at the beginning, and they say, well, should I charge or should I not? That's just the first question. Then you have a raft of questions uh, from pricing to propensity modeling and how you can do it right if you want to really gain circulation revenue and have a new strategy for the future. Now, one of the things that's absolutely core here, this is a diagram that I've used for a while and it really fits the digital circulation era, put together first by Steve Yeldington at Morris uh, Communications in Georgia. And this shows basically something that we knew but didn't pay enough attention to, that the people who are most likely to pay us are only 5 to 10% of the digital audience. The digital world, especially going back to what Google has fed us in traffic for all these years, exposes news content to, to huge numbers of people. But that doesn't mean that the majority of them will ever come close to paying for it. They just want to see a story here and there. So five to 10%. And if we look at this math, and we look at the math of digital circulation, in the US, the New York Times has about 30 million unique visitors. Their global number is about 50 million. But if we say their primary market for paid is the US, 30 million, um, and they also have 1 million print readers. That's a little high, but close to print, uh, uh, close to 1 million readers at this point. So what I've been saying is what digital circulation is about is a 3% solu solution. If you could get close to 3% of your unique visitors paying you something, you have a robust business in the digital area, and ironically, that equals about the number of people who read you and paid for your product in print. So we're talking about core readers. And in fact, where the New York Times is at today, at about 450,000 digital subscribers, and they also have the bundled ones, but just looking at the digital ones, they're at about 1.5% of the the domestic, the U.S. unique visitors. Interesting note on the New York Times is that the last calculation, uh, they told me that 12% of their subscribers, their digital subscribers, came from outside the U.S. And they were surprised mm -hmm. at that number. That's probably a combination of expats 
and non-US citizens. So paywalls target the top two to 10%. Now something I wrote about, I do a weekly column for the Neiman Journalism Lab at Harvard, and I wrote about the what I call the newsonomics of majority reader revenue a couple weeks ago. And this was a phenomenon that I'd been noticing for a while, but it was becoming more and more apparent and it connects directly to this notion of digital circulation. In the US, our old split pre-digital was 80% of the revenue came from advertising, 20% came from circulation. That was, that was a rule that seemed to apply in good times and bad times. Now, and this is an amazing transformation, U.S. dailies are rapidly pointing at 50% of their revenue coming from readers or circulation. Obviously, a combination of print and digital circulation. Here's a few numbers from the U.S. New York Times is now up to, this is not the New York Times company, but the New York Times itself as a publication. New York Times, 52% of its revenue is now coming from readers. Boston Globe, 47%. The Star Tribune in Minneapolis, 43%. Dallas Morning News, 38%. And Time Inc., one of the major magazine companies, 43%. And Time Magazine, as an example, is up five percentage points in just three years. The New York Times, as you can see on here, went up 4%, or 48% to 52%, in one year, and that's because of its digital circulation. Now, if we look globally, these are numbers that I've done. I do some work with a company called Outsell, which is a research and consultancy company in California. And I do an annual report for them looking at a lot of global numbers in the news trade. And you say in, in, in the world, 66% advertising income, about 30%. 4% circulation. And you see here how it varies. The U.S. is now up to, and these would be, this would be 2011 data at this point. U.S. would be up to about 29%, up from that old 20% to 29%. But in places like U.K., 48%. Um, Europe, we have the EMEA number of 30%. And you all know it, it varies considerably within Europe, depending on, on, uh, on systems and cultures. And amazingly, in, in Asia, um, it has been majority reader revenue for a long time. And in Japan, it is 72.5%. So all of these numbers essentially are pre-paywalls and pre-digital circulation. So these are only going to go up. Number four, smart pricing can reinforce print. New York Times has really led the way there uh, in saying, okay, if we price this smartly, we can help save some print. What they did when they started their system in January of 2011 was say they put out this pricing, which is still pretty similar, which is New York Times plus smartphone or New York Times plus tablet or all access, a term that everyone is now using. And they said, and I remember this because reporters asked me this question the first day, they said, you know, I, I, I kind of feel bad about it because I'm in the journalism business, but I, I dropped my New York Times print subscription. But I was looking at the pricing now, and it looked to me like if I take the Sunday paper, it's $60 a year cheaper to get digital access than if I don't take the Sunday paper. And when this first came out, people's heads were just turning. They go like, number one, they said, this is too confusing. And this makes no sense. Why would they force me to take the Sunday paper to save $60 a year if I only want digital access? Well, it turned out to be a brilliant stroke. And because the New York Times has a very good Sunday product, very different than the rest of the week, lots and lots of feature sections, magazines, uh, people said, that's pretty good. I would like to have the New York Times around. I could read it all during the week. Different people can read different sections. LA Times is now doing this. And so in the US, where we have a differentiated Sunday paper, this is now a key part of a strategy. In Europe, depending on the country, if it's a Saturday, Sunday edition, uh, or a stronger Saturday, Saturday edition, I think we'll see more of this as well. 
we're seeing at the same time, oops, going too, uh -huh. too fast there. In the U.S., we're seeing at the same time because of the uh, downturn in print advertising, uh, which is going to drop another 5 to 10 percent this year. Uh, we're seeing now a uh, increase in the number of papers that are dropping days of the week of print production. Uh, the big news two weeks ago was that the new house papers, new house or advanced publications, which is privately owned, but a fairly large newspaper company, a very old traditional company, was dropping its uh, print production from seven days a week to only three days a week in uh, New Orleans, the Times-Picayune, and then its three daily newspapers in Alabama. This is just part of a phenomenon, though. It started in 2009 in the depths of the recession. And in the U.S., we see now probably two dozen new daily newspapers, two dozen to three dozen that have dropped at least one day of the week. And I think we're going to see a lot more soon. In the U.K., the Johnston Press, uh, ba based in uh, Scotland um, and having papers uh, in, in several parts of the U.K., uh, just took five of its dailies and made them weekly, just like that and is now looking at doing that with dozens of others of its papers. So we're going to see how this is going to work and we're going to see how it fits with digital circulation, which is a very interesting question. Number five, digital uh, subscription is really a gateway drug. So once you have readers who are used to paying, everybody say, I, I know how to pay for a print subscription and I pay for a single copy. Oh, okay, and I understand now why you want me to pay for digital. You're giving me all this access. I don't know what you're doing behind the scenes, but uh, okay, I'll pay you. Then, now there, there is a possibility of selling them more products. And when you think about this from a newspaper company perspective, newspaper companies are used to selling one product. You want our paper, single copy or subscription, yes or no, and then you go away. Now... We're entering into this age of many news products because digital creation and distribution is so cheap and easy. Ebooks are coming quite quickly. This is the National Post in uh, Canada, and it uh, announced a program about three months ago of testing five ebooks with HarperCollins in Canada. Chicago Tribune, I talked to them two weeks ago. They're planning 20 ebooks just in the next year. Everybody is talking about mining the archives. So there are millions of newspaper articles and photographs, and newspaper companies have made very little money from them. And when you think of history, sports projects, uh, cultural events, the ability to take content, repackage it, put it into what we'll now call an ebook. I'm not sure if that term will last, but we'll call it an ebook and sell it is a new opportunity for daily newspaper companies and fits with the basic idea of digital circulation. It also fits with this idea of membership. So we have newspapers from the LA Times to the Boston Globe to uh, this paper here in uh, Connecticut, small daily in Connecticut called The Day, about 30,000 circulation. And they're saying, you're not just readers, you're not just subscribers, you're not just all access members. You are members. And so they are starting to do all kinds of things, and this connects to ebooks. So the Boston Globe, for instance, is saying we have a cookbook called Sunday Suppers, and we are giving it free to everybody who is a subscriber of the Boston Globe. And at the beginning, you couldn't even buy it. They may make it for sale soon. I don't think it's for sale yet, but it was a perk. And I have urged them, as I've talked to them, to come out with a whole series of these and then charge. And sure, give away a couple and, and you know, start a habit with your subscribers, but then say Sunday Suppers is $9.99, but if you're a member or a subscriber, it's only $5.99. I think we'll see a lot of that in the years ahead. And number six, the sixth one, digital circulation isn't a savior. Very importantly, this is just one building block, and, and all of us, I know, on, on, the, on the line here, we have been through uh, all kinds of change in, um, in the uh, 
newspaper world. I'm going to turn off escape here. And um, the question often comes up, is this going to save newspapers? This is, this is the question that uh, too many people ask about any innovation. And as is the case, usually no, there's no one thing they're going to save newspapers. Many newspapers are, one, are either one half to two thirds the size of what they were 10 years ago. Uh, it is unlikely newspapers will ever go back to the level of staffing they were at. 10 years ago, but we're talking about building a new business and a new business model. So it's one building block. And essentially, this is a new formula. The formula includes circulation, but now you can see how this is changing, and even from three years ago. So we have digital circulation and print circulation, and how they come together with all access. A relationship to a customer, a paying customer, who understands your brand, the value of your news, the news flow, and is paying you. And then we have advertising. We have print advertising, still in decline, will continue to be in decline. And we have digital advertising, which has a lot of its own challenges. And then, very importantly, on the cost side, we have all of these strategies around digital first. John Payton has gotten a lot of publicity, uh, both in Europe and in, in the US, uh, with Journal Register Company, now they have Digital First Media, and he has said, you know, two-thirds of the costs of the newspaper company have nothing to do with content or sales production. We need to get rid of many of those old, as, as many of those old costs as we can, as quickly as we can, and everybody's really doing that, whether it's Hearst or Newhouse or, or Axel Springer, everybody's doing it as fast as they can or they're saying they're doing it as fast as they can, some are actually doing it faster. But if you look at where the revenue is gonna be coming from into the future, how fast the cost can be reduced is a huge question. And then we have this other category, and that's another whole discussion too, of what other kinds of new things can be added to the revenue mix. So in, that, in this scenario, digital circulation, or really all access subscription, is a key part of what's going on. So that, that is the, uh, the basic uh, presentation I wanted to make today of talking about where we're at and these six truths that I, I've extracted at this point. Uh, happy to take questions or get into a, a discussion if anybody has any, uh, any questions to ask or comments. Okay, thank you, Ken. That again was very interesting and I want to pass your question to the audience. Um, Please give your comments in the chat or via your microphone, because if you don't, then I will have a chat with Ken. So take the <laughs> chance. <laughs> yeah, we've had good chats before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but I want the audience to ask. Yes. Maybe Martin? I have the feeling that we're lagging behind uh, US here in Austria, and I just don't see a, any paid content model to work within the like next years. So what's your... What do you suggest, or what would you suggest for the Austrian market? Because as, I, as far as I know, it is not is will stick to its uh, advertising only model, and I don't see any willingness to pay uh, within Austrian online journalism, especially since it's very agency driven uh, with the most output. So, from well, from what I remember of my, when when I visited a few months ago, isn't there one business publication that is charging? For, uh, for digital access. Thank you. I, I, can't, I can't quite hear you. I guess you're talking about Wirtschaftsblatt. Uh, probably. Yeah. I guess. Wirtschaftsblatt, so. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and do we know what their I, experience is? I don't. Is? I did not. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it, it is an interesting question. And, and it was, I remember uh, when we talked about it after the, the seminar in, in, uh, in Vienna, we talked about it. And, and it did seem like there was less experimentation in Austria than, than almost every other country I had uh, been in or talked to. Um, and usually it takes somebody to, to start it um, and, and to try it. Um, and the, the easy way is you have, you have print subscribers to the degree that any publication develops, 
a better digital presence. So often that means a, you know, a good smartphone app or a good iPad app. And then says, um, we're going to charge you, our friend subscribers, a little extra for, for that. Then you have, then you have the basis of doing it without uh, taking a lot of uh, risk. You have the ability to uh, try with your print subscribers uh, with, without even saying to all digital customers, you, you have a new product, please pay me a little more for this new product. So, and I, when I talk to some publishers, in, even in the U.S., they say, that's a better way to go anyways. They're not going to get, and I talked to the Star Tribune, for instance, in Minneapolis, they have 18,000 new digital subscribers. And he said, that's nice. That's a nice little business, 18,000. He said, though, we have increased our circulation revenue 7% in less than a year. And the way they're doing that is they're just charging the current subscribers, essentially the print subscribers, more. And they're saying, we're giving you digital access and we're, and we're charging more overall for a subscription. It would seem to me in Austria that that is an easier thing to do for subscription-based publications, obviously single copy or something else. It is interesting, and in, in, in Germany, there are uh, more than a dozen dailies that are now planning on going, uh, going to digital circulation. And they are meeting and putting in systems right now. So across the border in the, in the, the other major German-speaking countries, you're going to see a lot of movement very quickly. So this time next year, a lot of the German press is going to have digital circulation. And that may make a difference as well. Yeah, that for sure will make a difference for Austria too. Yeah, it's gonna be, it's <laughs> gonna be night and day a year, a year from now. Yeah, you sure? Yeah, in, in Germany, yeah. Given the given all the work that's going on there, and very little of it's been announced, but uh, but I know the work that's going on there, and um, and you're gonna see a major difference. Okay, I'm very. Yeah, I think we should talk in a year from now again, because this will be very interesting. It will be. Uh, Claudia Heidel wants to know, uh, first he thanks you for the presentation, but he wants to know how important will content of moving images be in future media behind paywalls? So it's, it's interesting with video. Video is still the, uh, the form that is producing the greatest um, advertising revenue. Uh, advertising revenue for the pre-rolls, the 15 seconds before a video, um, are uh, getting ad rates, advertising rates, usually three and four times what banner ads and other display ads are getting. So I think what we'll see is a, uh, a really a hybrid strategy. Because video produces such high, relatively high advertising revenue, News companies are going to want to make sure that those are well seen. So what you can do with the metered system, and this is, of course, what we're talking about with most of the digital circulation systems, is that they're metered. And they say, okay, you get 5, 10, 20 views a month, and then you have to pay. The easy thing to do for any publisher is to say, either a video view, someone hitting the play button on a video, counts as a one of those 20 articles a month, say, or it doesn't count. So you can try both ways. And the beauty of a metered system is you can adjust it and you can adjust it on the fly. You could say, on the one hand, if I give all my video away for free, then people are going to be less likely to want to pay me for digital access. On the other hand, if I put the video behind a paywall, then, um, then I'm going to have not enough views there to service the advertising. So you can take an in-between course. First of all, you, you, put, you, put, you want your video to be seen and you see um, if you put it behind a paywall, does it cause you any problem? If it doesn't cause you any problem, that's good because that's part of the value equation. If it does cause you a problem, then make at least some of the video views 
free. Again, the flexibility here, when I talk about execution, the flexibility of a metered system that is really managed. It's not like putting a system in and, and stopping. You put a system in and you manage it. That's, that is key, and, and I think the video question is a very good question, given the ad rates that are involved there. I wonder, you know, I wonder if if you have a, a free digital um, service now and you want to introduce paid circulation systems, where to start? Because this seems to be a very complex uh, yeah. topic. So if I am an Austrian newspaper uh, house, a newspaper media house, so where do I start with my considerations if I want to introduce pricing <laughs> because that seems to be very very difficult for me well and is it difficult because they don't have registration systems or because they don't have registration they haven't no it's because it's register. no because it's because it's difficult to, because it's it's hard to decide uh, how to develop a strategy so my question basically is uh, are there any strategies you can look and uh, look at and copy or do you have to develop your own strategy is there's a, there, are many, there are many to copy at this point. And in, in fact, with registration, you go back to the, the grandfather of, uh, of all of this, which is the Financial Times. And okay. a, lot, a lot of general newspapers say, well, that's the Financial Times, that's a financial newspaper, has nothing to do with this. And, and people said that until the New York Times became the first big general newspaper to do digital circulation. But in fact, the Financial Times went through all these same questions that the Austrian press is going through in 2012. But they went through these questions in 2001. And they said, you know what? First thing we have to do is we've got to make sure we get people to register. So what they would do is they would say, if you want, you know, you come to the site from wherever you come to the site. You come from Google, you come from Facebook, you come direct, you come from a friend. And then they would say, we'll give you, you know, 10 articles, not even <clears throat> put up a, a message or anything. But then they put up a message and the message would be, uh, we're glad you're enjoying the FT. We need to ask you to sign up to, to register. And signing up only means giving us your email address, but register. So they started with registration. And of course, some people went away, but they could look up all the numbers and say, well, it doesn't deter that many people. So people signed up and they registered. And if you look at the history of the FT over 12 years now, or 11 years now, they started with registration, no, you know, no credit card, you know, no profile information, just like an, an email address, built up how many questions. So tell us your uh, email address. Uh, tell us what kind of occupation you have. Very important for the FT. What kind of, what kind of business work do you do? Uh, you could ask age, you could ask, uh, you could ask other questions like that. And what they did over time is they moved from first you register. Now, still, if you go there, it'll say on that site, um, you get actually one article a month from the Financial Times without registering. Then you register, and then in three articles, you're asked to pay. So registration is a step in this process. And importantly, mm -hmm. it starts to capture the data on your visitors. And it does, and it makes, again, a kind of consumer sense if you say to people, we'll give it to you for free, but we just need, we need you to sign up. And, and most of us on the web go, okay, we'll give you, I'll give you my email address or I'll make up an email address and give it to you. <laughs> so I do think it, 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 it is an entry point. There are a lot of other things that the Austrian press can learn from these metered systems. Um, what Press Plus and Piano have done in, in different ways. There's a lot of learnings and a lot of data now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in fact, I saw uh, the last Press Plus presentation to its members. And um, you know, in a sales call, they'll, they'll make that presentation available. And whether people buy the Press Plus service or not, you can see how people think about it and what they've learned. And you also see what the beginning testing steps are. Okay. 
I have another question. What do you think about the Guardian's strategy? Well, I think it's a partial strategy. Um, I talked to uh, someone there about a month ago, and, and it was very interesting. So I, there's even a difference um, in the U.S., you know, the iPad version of the Guardian is a paid product, and it's fairly expensive. Um, I think it was about $60. Um, but in the UK, it's free. Yet on the uh, on the iPad um, through the Safari browser, I can get the Guardian website, which is even deeper than their iPad version, which they're asking me to pay for. I can get the uh, <coughs> excuse me. I can get the uh, Safari version for free. Makes no uh -huh. sense to me. Uh -huh. um, in, in one place, their smartphone application is paid. In another place, it's free. And so I think that uh, my, my quick take on The Guardian is it's an incredibly innovative place in terms of the journal. <clears throat> excuse me. It's incredibly innovative in terms of the journalism they're doing, uh, in terms of the testing they're doing in the digital realm. But in terms of their pricing, they are confronted by being really a global medium and have not been able to figure out a pricing strategy, both given the hyper competition of London and how to approach the American ooh, market. Ooh, sorry. I think it's. Sense. Ben, ben, can you wait? Can you wait a minute? Are you getting Switching on your microphone? Yeah. Okay, is it already on? But now we can hear you. You can try now. Okay, is that good? Is so that no. working or not? Now it's working. No? Can yeah, can can go on. <laughs> you can go. Yeah. No, wait. Let let Ken finish his oh, sure. sentence. <laughs> can it's okay. You so, can go on. <clears throat> so yeah, I think the Guardian, you know, has uh, is really something to watch in terms of their thinking and their their digital content strategy. I don't think their commercial strategy has settled yet into something mm -hmm. that makes sense. And I do think all access, as I pointed out, you know, movie companies, music companies, uh, cable companies, magazine companies, newspaper companies, all access makes sense. If you give, or what, what, what Warren Buffett said, if you give it to me free over here and, and ask me to pay over here, as a consumer, I say, I love the Guardian, you know, I, I love what they're doing with, uh, with the Murdoch story and Hackgate, it's incredible journalism, but it seems silly to me in the U.S. to pay $60 over here to get a version that is less deep than what I get on Safari. So I yeah. think they've got to figure that out. Mm -hmm. they were, actually, I didn't, I didn't know that they are charging in the U.S. Yeah. I don't. I don't know how many people do. You hit a wall, so you can find it in the uh, in the Apple newsstand, and uh, I don't think you can do, as I recall, much sampling. Um, I don't. No, I don't believe they've released any numbers in the U.S., but I don't think they're getting much traction here. Mm -hmm. And it's a hard sell anyway. So I said, like the New York Times has 12% of its digital subscribers overseas. That's a pretty decent number. It's this has been a problem. There are in the English-speaking world, you know, you have BBCs making inroads in the U.S. FT actually has more subscribers in the U.S. than the U.K., which is pretty mm -hmm. interesting. But that's built up over print over, you know, 15, 20 years. But for all these companies that are trying to go between, especially U.K. and U.S., uh, it's difficult because the, the brands have different meanings in each place. Mm-hmm. Okay. You Not bad. Bernard? Now Bernard like has a setup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's so you know oh, right. he's really cool. Bernard. Thank you very much. Does it, does it work now? Can you hear me? Sounds oh, ooh, you're extremely right. loud, Bernard. Right. It sounds terrible. Maybe you can turn turn down your volume here in the microphone settings, like adjust microphone volume. If you click on the arrow, will be on the side of the microphone sign. Because otherwise, all of us need a, a, a doctor to repair our ears. <laughs> Is it better now? I tried to turn it down. Okay, great. All 
All right. Yeah, uh, it's better now. I'd like to ask you about um, nearly every day there are new messages about uh, new players entering uh, digital ecosystems like, I don't know, telecom companies entering content and mobile operators entering uh, new yeah. mobile operating systems. And, and I think it's all connected to each other, that's for sure. And I would like to ask you if there is, can see, if you can see some kind of general trend because it's changing every day and so fast and, and maybe can you identify some, some overall trends? Can you tell how it would look like in, in about five years or is there something? And, and specifically in terms of, of telecom, uh, uh, telcos, telecom, yeah, manufacturers, mobile operators. Uh, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, who, who, will, who will maybe dominate in, in five years is, if there is some trend because I think yeah, the content creators, if you're a pure content creator, you're at the moment you're losing in, in com compared to, to other players. I think that's true. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a big problem. And um, my prime example of that here in the US is Comcast. So Comcast is what we would call a pipes company, right? It was, it was a company that all it did was license television and it has cable throughout the entire US and through cable TV. And I've learned in talking to, to you in, in Vienna and, uh, and to Europeans generally, Americans pay about two to three times for cable television what you pay for uh, cable or satellite in Europe. So we pay a huge amount of money. And Comcast uh, is the biggest cable company, but there are three or four others like Time Warner and Charter. Um, they are now getting into content. So last year, Comcast bought NBC Universal. And NBC Universal is not only NBC News, which is a, a, a huge, uh, huge news provider, broadcast news provider. It's Telemundo, which is one of the largest Spanish language services in, in the country. And they are producing huge amounts of sports content now, both through cable television and uh, their own digital networks. So what I think we'll see, Bernard, is we'll see actually more of the companies that are um, telecommunications companies that are very profitable, that have huge cash flow because we're paying them so much money, I think we'll see them buy up more content assets and that there will be fewer independent media and more media that are attached to larger companies that are essentially communications companies or tel telco companies. Now that has a lot of risk in it, given what we believe about the principles of journalism and how we serve the public and try to make those decisions, um, as opposed to a cable company that kind of looks at the world of, is this profitable or is it not? And that's how we're gonna, that's how we're gonna decide what, what to fund and, and how to proceed. So I think that's one of the directions we're gonna go. Another direction, importantly, and I think one of the best models we have in the digital world is ESPN Sports. Now, ESPN Sports is owned by Disney. And if you say, what's the number one sports outlet in the US, it's ESPN. Cable television is where it started. Very, very strong on the desktop, mobile applications, paid products, premium products, they're doing print now. They do an ESPN magazine. They, they get paid by the cable companies. They're owned by Disney. So in this case, Comcast would pay them for carriage on cable, say three or $4 a month. They're one of the highest paid ones. So that business model where you produce content, but also they're within this larger company, Disney, again, they're within a larger company and then get paid for the business model here of getting paid for what you do several different ways. Some reader payments directly, subscriptions for uh, digital products and print products, some payments from cable companies, a lot of advertising revenue. You can see the model here that they're getting three or four different kinds of revenue and they have this bigger company behind them. I think those are two of the routes that we're going and it's and at the the flip side of it may be that and we're seeing this movement in the us more than in europe 
that essentially we can say that journalism is less a creature of the market than it used to be. We know that news companies have been, until the last five to 10 years, among the most profitable com companies there are, making very high profits. Now that world is, has declined quite rapidly. Um, it's gonna be hard for them to maintain profits without continued cost cutting. So if news companies are no longer creatures of the market, very profitable ones, what we're seeing in the US is a lot of nonprofit journalism. I live in California here and we have in the Bay Area now a project, a nonprofit organization called California Watch, which has 50 journalists. It has about 75 people overall, but 50 journalists covering the news in Northern California, all funded by foundations um, and uh, sponsorships and uh, is not a creature of the market, is not a for-profit company. I think because of the reaction and, and in a sense, the corporatization of news, cable companies, ESPN, the counterweight to that is people individually through memberships, a public radio model here, and foundations helping to pay for journalism because it's public service journalism is coming to the fore but it's just an absolute mess because we're losing a lot more than we're gaining in this process. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you have a relatively stable world right now there. And I, I don't, I, I, it, it's just fascinating to see how long it will stay mm -hmm. as stable yeah. as it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what, what, what has been the, uh, the uh, loss of journalism jobs in Austria? What do you think it's been in the last five years? Has there been a lot or a little? Yeah, now it's a little. Huh? I, th I think there's not too much loss. It's only that there are no uh, young people don't have the chance to enter in the job because there is the problem right. of many, many freelancers. This is a huge discussion now, young freelancers who, who get paid very little and who don't have, have any chance to get a fixed job at the news right. company. But I don't think, but Bernhard, uh, maybe you correct me, but I don't think that they well, have, there have been many losses interest. of jobs. Yeah, there, there, there have, be, of course, been uh, some people who got a golden handshake. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, especially in the in the public yeah. television, but also in, at newspapers. Yeah, but, but in but general, the employment the employment's been fairly steady. And is that is that just because it, it, advertising revenues have gone down, but not that much, or profits are lower, or what do you think's going on? From my my point of view, there's there's not so much impact like compared to the U.S. There is in, in the newspaper business until now, at least, there is not. Uh, that much impact of, of this crisis in Austria. Yeah. That's what I have seen so far. I know if I'm right, maybe. Daniela, you know more. <laughs> yeah, a yeah. A lot less than even Germany. Yeah. Yeah, a lot less. And uh, even if you look at the circulation rates in print, then you see that they don't go down that as fast as they go in, in Germany. Yeah. So. Yeah, but I mean, I think that's a huge chance for Austria because we can, you know, lean back and <laughs> and watch right, what's you going have on. To learn. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You have the luxury of time. <laughs> yeah, maybe I think so. Ken, there's another question by Sabine. Uh, she asks, uh, as more and more users are no, not core users because they visit news sites uh, via social media and Facebook. Right. Would you recommend social, re social reader apps? Yeah, I think social reader apps are very important. And the way I look at that is they're es essentially it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a, a funnel that especially if you look at the apps that The Guardian, uh, National Public Radio in the US, uh, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal have, have put into place, they have been very successful and they've had a little problems more lately with the algorithms of Facebook, but that's a different discussion. But these apps have been very successful at exposing the really traditional news brands to a new generation. Uh, incre incredible split of younger readers 
uh, really in their teens. The Guardian is finding a lot of teenage readers and readers in their 20s. So the trick, it seems to me, is sure, social apps work. You decide what kind of content. So it's not just a matter of saying we're going to put everything that's on our front page on our social app. But if your audience is, you know, between 15 and 30, okay, watch, you know, watch what people re read and adjust the presentation to give them a little more of what they are reading more. And then the big question then becomes a business question of how do these people become customers in some way? And part of this is advertising targeting. If you have 20 year olds who are reading your brand and you have enough of them, you can target those readers. And right now, for instance, Facebook is allowing news publishers to sell ads on Facebook and um, isn't taking any of the money uh, that, that is earned from the revenue. Now that'll change over time, but so they can target them that way. And then as I was talking about eBooks and, and other um, products that news companies can create, uh, the idea of once you have a new audience that's building, how do you make money on advertising? How do you make money possibly on subscriptions, although that may be more difficult, but also how do you offer specific products that they may buy as one-off products. So I think it's a wonderful discovery technique to use social media, and then you have to work really hard to figure out how you connect that up to making money from a new group. But it's a good problem to have. And Facebook has been really the first way we have seen that a lot of traditional news companies have reached a younger audience and a substantially younger audience. So that's very positive. Okay. I have a minor question, I really, uh, just a little question to understand better what you were saying. You said that some, uh, da some dailies are switching to like four days and which days are, the, are these? Right. Uh, so in the US it's Sunday. So Sunday carries uh, usually somewhere between 40 and 55 percent of all the advertising revenue in a week. Okay. So, of course, you want to keep Sunday. There are a lot of uh, inserts, uh, a lot of circulars from department stores and others, electronic companies in the Sunday paper. Sunday is a big day. And then usually the second day they want to keep is usually a Wednesday. Wednesday is traditionally a food day in American newspapers where uh, you used to have a lot of grocery ads, but still it's kind of a market day. So it's midweek, you know, across the week from Sunday. Wednesday is good. And then usually the third day they keep is a Friday. So okay. people's rhythms change. You move from business into leisure. You want an entertainment program. You want to know what's going on the weekend. So Sunday, Wednesday, Friday. And we see minor tweaks in that. The day they want to keep least is Monday. Um, journalists don't like to work on the weekend. They don't produce <laughs> much news for Monday. <laughs> uh, um, advertisers don't really like Monday. Uh, Monday is like a little finger. If everybody could cut off their Monday publication, they'd be happy to do it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, and another question: Have you got uh, an example who um, who is good at your topic mining the archives? I think. Uh, there are not that many good examples. So the Chicago Tribune, I, I said, you know, had done, had, is putting together 20 ebooks. They had done one or two ebooks off of sports before. Um, they uh, okay, so so the I, I didn't get that. So the ebooks are from the archives. Uh, from the archives, right? Ah, okay. Sorry, and, maybe. And essentially, <laughs> what all newspaper companies have done. I mean, we've been on the internet now for almost 20 years. And there are a lot of archives, a lot of newspaper companies, and they'll say, you know, you can pay $1.95 or, or two euros for each article. And it's been a tiny business because most people don't want to do that. And so now what we see, and I think it's especially because of the tablet, people are saying, oh, we can look at these archives completely differently. And the wonderful thing I, I love about this is I'm still an editor, is it's an editorial function. You say, we're not selling archives. We're not selling a million articles. Who wants a million articles? We're saying, 
you want to know the history of this event. You want to know everything about, you know, the Queen's Jubilee and the, um, I think it was the BBC. I'm trying to remember who did, somebody did a big ebook off the Queen's Jubilee in London. Um, and in, um, in, uh, well, in, in, in Austria, I remember two years ago, Appa did the Opera Ball as one of the first specials on the tablet. And it was very, very early because the iPad was just out for five months. But you're kind of thinking about what do you have in your archives and you're thinking as an editor of how do you create something special. Huge opportunity. And in this case, people will pay for the packaging. They're, think they're paying for the thinking. They're paying for the presentation and the packaging. You don't even need to create that much new content. Magazines have done this in print for a long time, but it's very expensive to do it in print, a lot cheaper to do it in the digital world. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll give you one more example that I found interesting. I was talking to the people at Wonder Factory, which is a uh, major design house in New York City. They work with Time Inc. And so if you remember almost three years ago now, we all sent around to each other a, a link on YouTube where Sports Illustrated was saying, when the tablet comes along, this is before the iPad launch, when the, when the iPad comes along, or you didn't know, you didn't even know it was gonna be called an iPad. When the tablet comes along, here's what Sports Illustrated might look like. This was produced by the Wonder Factory, your top end designer. So I was talking to uh, David Link, who is a co-founder there. And he said, let me tell you what we can do with this medium. He said, there's a book uh, called uh, Thousand Things to Do Before You Die. People always love these kinds of books, right? Thousand Things to Do. He said, well, we created an ebook, which is on Amazon and it's all words. It's a book with words. We know what that is. He said, we also created an app. And a lot of these, a lot of the app was highly visual and highly interactive. So he's taking the same format, he's taking the same book, but because in an app form, you can do so much more for it with, with it, he was creating another experience and then they were charging more for the app than they're charging for the ebook, yet it's essentially the same content. So if you look at this from a newspaper or magazine perspective and you say, we produce a huge amount of content every day, we've got all this content in our archives, how can we now put it together? on an instrument as revolutionary as a tablet and how can we charge people and also get sponsorships this is a whole new way of approaching journalism and i hope daniela in a year from now i have many more examples to be able to talk about <laughs> of people yeah. doing that because there aren't that many people doing it yet do you know any working example of a news outfit that is solely funded through micropayments and no means of bundled content or pay bars? No. Asks Martin. No. no, Martin. no, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's a quick end. No. <laughs> micropayments have been fairly small. Uh, there, is a, there is a company you can look up on the web called Later Pay. Have you seen this company called Later Pay? L A T E R. P A Y. It's a German company, um, and they are talking to a number of publishers, and they're worth taking a look at as well. So they are they are into micropayments. Largely, micropayments have not yet worked, though. But we'll see. There are a lot of things in the last 20 years that haven't worked that can get new life, um, especially since content creation can be different. Okay, last round of questions. No questions. I have another question, Ken. You know, I have the same problem the, the huge newspaper companies have. So do you also consult very small uh, training associations and institutes on pricing? Oh, I've, I've, talked to, I've talked to a lot of organizations. It's hard. Well, they, they always say that newspaper companies, when they were very profitable, would say they didn't have any money. And now they really say they don't have any money. 
<laughs> I mean, no, I'm listening to you with huge interest, and that's just my my joke to finish this webinar, because uh, we ha we have the same problems. Our question is sure. how to sell our courses and our seminars, and what is the what is the package, and where shall we start, and what is our paywall, and what can we give away for free, and what right. what are the formats you can pay for with a tweet, <laughs> as you, as you could for this webinar. That's right. uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I hope I enjoyed it, Ken. Thank you very much. It was good. It was good to, to talk with everyone. <laughs> and I hope the audience enjoyed it too. And it was good to see you. Yeah, it, it was great to see you. And Ken, thanks a lot. Thank you very much for talking to us and for sharing your ideas. Quite I well. hope I hope that we will see you again in Vienna in person. I hope so. We'll see. We'll, we'll see what we can work out. Yeah, we have to talk about that <laughs> in an in a even more private setting. Yeah. <laughs> Another session. Uh, well, ha have, every a good, have a good evening. I have a, I have a whole full day of work to do now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we will have a nice evening and watching watching soccer games because, you know, we have to European Championship. Well, have a beer the... for me. Yeah, okay, we'll have that. <laughs> Sabine and Claudia and Martin say thank you very much for this session and are sending their regards. Thank you very much.